Grace and peace to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship in the expanded community of First Presbyterian Church, San Anselmo. We're glad you're here. We are um, grateful and excited to be worshiping in this expanded community from folks from Marin County and California and across the country and around the world. Um, this is holy ground wherever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey, there is a place for you here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, during the summer, we are moving through worship with a the theme of Together We Create, as we explore all the ways that God has created us in God's image to create a new and better world with God. And today, uh, our nation particularly is um, remembering the way that we've seen that lived out in the life of Congressman John Lewis, a civil rights icon and a statesman, um, someone who was there on the lunch counters in the civil rights movement and who has led in the halls of Congress. I heard uh, Congressman Lewis interviewed once and the person asked him how uh, did he go through so many setbacks with something that was so important to him to um, be pushed back again and again and with the wisdom that he had from a life well lived. He replied, you know, we have to live life as if. We have to live life as if the world that we are trying to create is already here. And by doing that, we help to make it so. Friends, that is wisdom uh, for justice movements, for the civil rights movement. It is wisdom for every bit of life. And we do that every day, every Sunday when we gather here in worship. We live as if the reign of Christ is already here, already complete. And by doing so, we help to make it so. Friends, this is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's worship God. And let's continue in worship by lifting our voices together and singing our, oh, by joining in our call to worship first. And I'm going to invite Dave to come and lead us in our call to worship. Dave. Please join us in the call to worship. The psalmist writes, O oh God, you have searched me and you know me. God is with us always when we sit and when we rise. God is with us in our going out and in our lying down. God is familiar with all our ways. God is present with us right here, right now, with me here, with you there. Everywhere, all the time, surely God is in this place, and this is holy ground. Come, let's worship God. This is holy ground indeed, wherever you are. And as we worship today, we're going to be turning to a text in Genesis about um, Jacob's dream, uh, his vision of a ladder. Uh, grounded in the earth and rising up to the heavens. And so we'll begin by singing together, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. And I'll invite Danielle to come and lead us in our first song. Danielle. We are climbing.
Please join me in the call to confession. Searching, loving God, you are familiar with all our ways. You know us at our best, created in the image of you. You know our hurt. You know the ways we participate in the hurt and harm of the world. In the silence of these moments, search us and know us. Bless us with your healing, loving, saving touch, and lead us in the way everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join with me as we affirm God's creating and recreating grace. With the whole church, we affirm that we are made in God's image, befriended by Christ, empowered by the Spirit. With people everywhere, we affirm God's goodness at the heart of humanity, planted more deeply than all that is wrong. With all creation, we celebrate the miracle and the wonder of life, the unfolding purposes of God, forever at work in ourselves and the world. Friends, let us proclaim the good news together. In the creating spirit of the risen Christ, we are forgiven, loved, and set free. Alleluia. Amen. Alleluia. Amen. And having proclaimed together um, God's grace, now's the time when we share that grace and that peace with one another. And we've been doing that in a couple of ways. The first way that we are sharing uh, God's peace is through sign language. And we've learned that it is peace. Be with you. Peace. Be with you. And also with you. And now um, I invite you to um, uh, unmute your microphones so we can exchange signs of and words of peace with each other. May the may the peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you. Hi, Walt. Hi, Libby. Hey. Peace, Ruth. Carol saying hi to Walt and Libby. Hey, Walt. Hey, Libby. Oh, what a beautiful Pentecostal sound of peace. And I heard someone say, hello, Walt and Libby. And I don't see you here, but hello, Walt and Libby. We're glad you're here. And this uh, is the time in worship where Patrick, our director of family ministries, and the children come and lead us. So this time is especially for you, June, Everett, Andrew, Cece, Paula, Luca, Nico, Mateo, Cecilia, Evan, Isaac, Frank, Gwen, Charlotte, Elle, Ashley, Nate, Theo, for all the children out there, for everyone who is a child at heart. Um, Patrick, come and lead us. Thanks, Reverend Scott. Hello, my friends. It is so great to see you on my little laptop screen this morning. I hope you are having just the greatest Sunday. Uh, it just makes my heart so happy when I get to see you on the, my computer screen. Friends, I want us to practice something. We did this, um, I think, about a year ago. So it's okay. We're going we're gonna to do a little refresher. But there's this cool thing that we can do with our hands. So get your fingers all loosened up and wiggled and ready to go. And we did this thing where we, we have the saying that goes like this. Here's the church. And so when we say here's the church, we're going to take our hands and we're going to kind of fold them in like this. So that you can't see the fingers. 
and then you're going to fold them down like that. Okay, so there's the church. So you can kind of see there's the church. And then if you put the if you put your pinkies up, if you can put your pinkies up, that's the steeple. So here's the church. Here's the steeple. And then if you open your hands, who is that? That's all the people. That's all the people. Okay, let's try this one more time. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open it up. And there's all of the people. Great job, friends. But I have a question. Where is God? Where is God in that, in that little equation? We've got our church, which I see right here on my computer screen. We have our church building where the steeple is. And we have all of our awesome people. But where is God, friends? Friends, I'm here to tell you that God is everywhere. God is with us in everything. So God is in the church. God is in the steeple. And God is in all of the people. God is in you when I see you and you're smiling happy faces on my computer screen. God is with nature and with the birds who are singing with us this morning in worship. And God is even with a new guest that I can't wait to introduce you to. Be funny. God is even in my new puppy whose name is Archie. Archie came from a shelter just three days ago and we have already become really good friends. And friends, when I think of God and when I think, where is God in this place? I see God in Archie's face just like I see God in your face, in my friends' faces, and in our church building, and in nature, God is all, all around us. Isn't that right, Archie? That's right. Okay, friends, I have invited Gina and the boys to say the pretzel prayer with me. So I'm going to unmute Gina, and here we go. Let's say our pretzel prayer, okay? Ready? Repeat after me. All right, repeat after me, boys. God, I love you. I love you. Help me to love others. As you love me. As you love me. Amen. 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 Great job, boys. All right, Reverend Scott, back over to you. Awesome. So thank you, Anders and Everett, for helping out. And thank you, Archie, also. And Patrick, I had forgotten how much coordination that takes, or maybe it didn't when I was younger, but that's, it that's, really kind of, does. that's, a, lot, that's a lot of choreography there, but thank you for that. Um, as we turn to our scripture, we are um, coming back to the Genesis story. When we left off a few weeks ago, we had spent a couple weeks with Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, and you may remember that um, Isaac had been born to Sarah and Ishmael had been born to Hagar. And now that we come back to the story, we're in the next generation. So Isaac, has, Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, have had two sons, Esau and Jacob. They're twins, but Esau is the eldest. Esau is born first, followed by um, Jacob grabbing at Esau's heel. Uh, so Esau is the eldest, um, the one who is to inherit. And Jacob, bless his heart, Jacob is trouble. He's one of my favorite biblical characters. Um, but by the point in this story, they have, they have grown up, and Jacob, with the help of his mother, has managed to finagle his way into getting both Esau's birthright and Esau's blessing. So most of everything that Esau has, Jacob has pulled his way, and Esau's not exactly happy about that. Esau is enraged. Esau is out for blood. Their mother sees this. So she does her best to get Jacob out of town. She sends him back to their, their initial homeland to find a wife. He sets out on the journey away from everything he knows out into the wilderness. And on the first night, he arrives in a certain place. Weary, he finds a stone uh, to lay his head on as a pillow, and he has a dream. And that's the story that we will hear now. And I'm going to invite Dave to come and read uh, this passage from Genesis 28. Dave. Jacob left Beersheba and went to Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. 
Taking one of the stones of the place, he set it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And God stood beside him and said, I am God, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread around to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, surely God is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? There is none other, this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel. We celebrate the written word of scripture. Thanks be Thanks. to God. We celebrate the living word. Christ among us. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Holy God, present with us now, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to do your will. Amen. So, have you been having vivid dreams lately? I ask that because evidently that's a thing. During these days of pandemic and sheltering, more and more people are having and remembering more dreams, vivid dreams. The first hint of this was in April when there was a spike in the Google search. Is anyone else having vivid dreams? And apparently the answer is yes. I know I've been dreaming more, or at least remembering dreams more, and I've heard some of you say the same. In one dream I remember from a few weeks ago, I'm, I'm standing at the kitchen sink washing dishes. Hillary Clinton is there with me, and we're talking about how important the simple, ordinary things in life have been to her since she lost the election. Deirdre Barrett, psychologist and professor at Harvard Medical School, has begun to research what she calls this pandemic dreaming to interview folks and she started to collect what seems to be a wave of vivid dreams. As she's beginning to work with the dream data that she's collecting, Dr. Barrett explains that a number of factors seem to have come together to make more dreaming more likely. For those on the hospital front lines, there is trauma that is generating trauma dreams. For the rest of us, we're experiencing what's the equivalent of a major life change, a major disruption, and as we stay closer to home and shelter, folks are getting more sleep, not necessarily all of it restful sleep, but with more sleep, there's more chance that we'll enter into the REM, the REM sleep where dreaming happens. Now it's amazing how Dr. Barrett describes it. As we sleep, different parts of our brain rest while other parts go into action. The verbal areas slow down while the visual areas get more active. What's going on when we dream is often a continuation of our day, but we're processing all this in this other state of consciousness. So Dr. Barrett says it's not surprising that there seems to be a correlation from what she's seeing between being anxious by day and having anxiety dreams by night. And these days our waking life is more dreamlike, more surreal, as some folks deal with daily vivid trauma and as we all collectively move through a world with both this sometimes acute fear of pandemic and the foggy haze of sheltering. Another psychologist, Ruben Nyman, explains, when our life is more vivid, so are our dreams. In this morning's scripture, Jacob 
has a vivid dream. I found a great commentary on this scripture by our own Jana Childers, and she says Jacob has one of the great dreams in the history of dreaming. Now at the outset, it's important to say that folks in the biblical world would have understood dreams and dreaming differently than we do. Everything I've just said presupposes and flows out of the modern disciplines of psychology, psychiatry, and brain science. In the biblical world, and as we see in this scripture, dreams were understood as one way to experience an actual appearance of God, a theophany. We have biblical stories of angels coming with a message during waking hours. We know those stories. This is a nighttime version of that. What's more similar to us, perhaps, like us, Jacob is certainly living an anxious life in an anxious time. Jacob is on the run. He's got himself into a mess. In a world where the second son doesn't have much of a chance, Jacob has, with his mother's help, managed to finagle his elder brother's birthright and his elder brother's blessing. He's taken Esau's inheritance and covenant blessing, and not surprisingly, Esau is enraged and out for blood. Their mother sees this clearly, and before one son kills the other, she manages to get Jacob out of town sending him back to Abraham's homeland to find a wife. Jacob will be gone and on the run for 10 years. And here Jacob is, maybe with a birthright and a blessing tucked away in his knapsack, but effectively exiled from his home and from his family, from everyone and everything he knows. And he journeys out into the wilderness to Haran. He goes as far as he can and as night falls, on a barren scrap of land, Jacob searches around for a place to lie down. He finds a rock that will do in a pinch as a pillow, and he lays his head on that rock, and he sleeps, and he dreams. In his restless, anxious, fearful sleep, Jacob dreams of a ladder. Now, maybe it's more like a staircase or a ramp twisting and ascending, but a ladder rooted in the ground and ascending to the heavens with angels traveling up and down, shuttling back and forth between the earth and the heavens. And then God is there right beside Jacob. And God says, Jacob, I'm God. I'm your God, the God of your parents, the God of your people. And I've promised you land and a family. You will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Know that I am with you. I will go where you go. I won't leave you. I will do what I promise. And Jacob wakes up and says, surely, surely God is in this place. This is the house of God and the gateway to the heavens. And Jacob takes that stone pillow and he blesses it. This is the house of God. Whatever we think about dreams, what we see here with Jacob, what we experience here with Jacob is the nearness of God. In those first moments of 10 years of exile, when Jacob feels most alone, separated, isolated from everything he knows, what he sees and experiences is the nearness of God. Jacob sees this vision of a ladder connecting the earth to the heavens, no separation between the two angels going up and down, this constant commerce between heaven and earth. And then God speaks, not from the heavens, not even from that ladder, but right there beside him, Jacob, I am your God, I'm with you wherever you go, I won't leave you. And waking, Jacob declares, this is the house of God, God is here, God is near. Now notice where Jacob is. I won't say he's in the middle of nowhere because Jacob is somewhere. Scripture says he has come to a certain place, but it's unexpected. What Jacob names as the house of God is a bare scrap of wilderness where he could find nothing more than a rock or a pillow. We sometimes go to great lengths searching for a holy place, searching for an encounter with God. We go to the ocean and stand on the shore to hear the waves crash in. Crash in. We hike a mountain trail to get a glimpse of the vastness of what God has made. We go to cathedrals and to church looking for holy ground. Jana Childers writes, sometimes we find the holy place, sometimes the holy place finds us. 
Sometimes we don't recognize that place as holy. Jacob, after all, fell asleep on his. In his dream, and when he woke, Jacob found God near. Some place, somewhere, in an ordinary moment, in a tumultuous and an anxious life, Jacob found God near there. In that certain place with a promise that God would be near, in the next place too, and in the next. John Wesley said of this text, God is there where we did not think they had been, found where we did not ask. In an anxious and fearful world, Jacob finds God near, everywhere, all the time. Notice also that Jacob's experience of the nearness of God is inclusive. Neither the nearness of God nor Jacob's dream is for Jacob alone. God says, remember all the promises I've made to your people. I'm here with you too, and you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. This moment, this nearness of God, it's not just for Jacob or for his particular people. It's for the whole world. We often think of spiritual moments like this as deeply personal epiphanies, moments when we experience something so much bigger than us. They are personal. And the nearness of God, when we experience it, it is for the whole world. The nearness of God in any given moment is not for us alone. Our dreams are not for us alone. The nearness of God is for the whole world, here, there, everywhere, as true for you as it is for me, as it is for everyone in the whole wide world. And that transforms how we experience those moments. God is just as near to you as God is to me. God is just as near to others who are worshiping right now in other spaces. God is just as near to those who are not worshiping. God is just as near to folks who are living and sleeping outside every night. God is just as near to children who lay down their heads to sleep in detention camps at the border. God is just as near to George Floyd in those last moments of his life. God is just as near in the hospital ICU rooms where nurses and doctors care for folks, hope against hope. If we name that and begin to see that God near everywhere with everyone, it has to transform the way that we see every situation, the way that we see other people. God just as present with them as with us. God just as concerned with their struggle as ours. God at work in the midst of the suffering of the whole wide world, near near to particular people in particular pain, everyone, everywhere, we begin to see ourselves connected, connected to others by the nearness of God, by the abiding love of God. As we name that and see that, this nearness of God, it calls us to be near there too, to stand where God stands, to help God do what God does. I want to give us a project for this week, and it's just to notice the nearness of God in every moment. Or if that feels like a stretch, then it is to name it before we see it. God is near, and then to wait to see how it appears. Celtic spirituality, a spirituality that emerged in Ireland and Scotland, has the sense of the nearness of God in all things as one of its hallmarks what John Philip Newell calls the heartbeat of God in all creation. Celtic spirituality sees God present, near in all things, and in that, a sense of deep connection, our connection to God, our connection to all creation, our connection to each other, deep connection in all the parts of life, no separation between our work and our prayer, one whole life. Esther DeWall describes it like this, God here and now with me, close at hand, God present in life and in work, immediate and accessible. She calls it a down-to-earth spirituality in which God breaks in on the ordinary so that in any moment, any object, any job of work can become the time and place for an encounter with God. Now, one of the ways that that is named in Celtic prayer is in prayers of blessing. Blessing the ordinary and the everyday, and it works like this. We approach every moment in life recognizing that that moment is a gift from God with the potential for good. 
We then ask God to bless whatever is in that moment in us to create more good in the world. And so Celtic prayers of blessing go like this. Bless the earth beneath my foot in every step. May it lead me in a good and healthy path. Or bless my hands this morning. May they make something that is of use to the world. Or bless this mask I'm making. May it keep someone safe. Our project this week, our something to do, is to try that type of blessing in our day-to-day -day moments. Bless this new morning that I might live this day to do good in the world. Bless this meal I'm preparing. May it nourish my family. Bless even this newscast that I'm listening to, that I might with others figure out something to do. We name the nearness of God to the world in the ground beneath our feet, in our hands, in the work that we do, in the life that we live. That dream I had where I was washing dishes. Well, back in the 1600s, a monk named Brother Lawrence wrote about the spirituality of everyday tasks, particularly washing dishes. He would even pray during his work in the monastery kitchen to what he called the Lord of the pots and pans. Where I stand in my kitchen to wash dishes, right behind me, there are several photographs, including one of me with Hillary Clinton when I met her at a campaign event way back in 1992. And washing dishes, well, that's pretty much what I do every day. I Zoom, and I write, and I take a walk, and I make meals, and I wash dishes, and I sleep, and the next day I do all that again. All of that, Brother Lawrence, the photo of Hillary Clinton, washing dishes, it's all rattling around up here in my head. That dream just gave me a glimpse of what I see every day and helped me make some meaning out of it. We are created to create. We are meaning makers, making meaning out of and into a fractured and a confusing world. Every moment of every day, God is near with us, blessing our hands that they might reach out in compassion, blessing our shoulders that we might be strong in the work of dismantling injustice, blessing our eyes that we might see the beauty of creation, our ears that we might truly listen to each other. God is near. As we speak of these days as days of distancing, and as we also name the nearness of God, we may find, we may find in these days that we are more connected than we ever knew. As we bless the ordinary moments of these ordinary days, we may find, we may find that God is nearer than we have ever imagined, or better yet, God is nearer than we have yet to imagine. And as we lean into this nearness of God, um, we do that and we claim that as, as we move into prayer. I, um, I, I went to a, a Marin Interfaith prayer session with uh, Rabbi Susan Leiter uh, in Marin County, and she was actually talking about the Jacob's Ladder text, and she suggested that when we pray, you know, we usually say settle in and put your feet on the ground and feel the ground, but then she also said, and imagine the top of our bodies connected to the heavens, rooted in the ground, connected to the heavens, and connected with each other, connected with each other in the love of this community as we move into prayer. As we move into prayer in the love of the community, I also, I want to share that um, on, on Friday morning, Don Beth passed away. Um, so we want to particularly pray um, for Patty and uh, for Gabriel and for Ruth and for their family as we move into prayer. Uh, friends, let us bring everything that we have, every bit of us to this time of prayer. And to begin our prayer, uh, we'll pray with, with a song and then some silence. There's an opportunity for you to share prayers 
in the, the chat. Um, and I invite Robin to come and begin our prayer and song. Let's sing together. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. creator of all creation, Christ who loves the world without exception, empowering spirit for the whole of life in your presence in all of it, we give you thanks and praise. Bless this day, O God, our lives, that we might live each day for you. Bless our eyes that we might see with you the beauty of this earth, along with the harm we continue to inflict on it, that we might find better, sustainable, healing ways of living. Bless our ears, that we might listen to each other, that we might hear the deep need of the world and respond with shelter for those who need a home, with food for the hungry, with comfort for those who mourn, with companionship for those who are lonely. Bless our hands, that we might extend your loving, healing touch. In a world wrapped in pandemic, help us to persevere in ways of disciplined living that protect and honor the health and well-being of others. Bless the work of nurses and doctors and all in the healing professions. Give them strength, gird them up, bring tender healing to the trauma they see and experience every day. We pray for an end to pandemic. Bless our shoulders that they might be strong in the work of justice. Give us steady, unfailing commitment to join the work of dismantling systemic racism and to do the work that is ours to do, to unlearn what we need to unlearn, that we might see the world as it is, our part in it, and then create with you the world as it should be. In the words of Congressman Lewis, let us live as if the world you are calling into being is already here right here, right now, in us. Bless our arms that we might stretch them out in the full and inclusive embrace of community. As we gather here, one body, we give you particular thanks this day for the life of Don Beck. We thank you for all the ways his life blessed the world, for his kindness, for his wisdom. We pray for Patty and Gabriel and Ruth and their family. Help us surround them with all the comfort and all the love that they need for the living of these days. We give you thanks most of all 
for the sure promise of resurrection and for the life we live with you forever. Gathered here in the body of Christ, present with you and connected with all creation, we join our voices with the voices of all who have ever prayed the prayer that Jesus taught, praying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, welcome, uh, welcome to worship. We're so glad to see everyone um, as, as we gather to continue in our life of, of worship. We are, as we've said, in this worship service, a community that believes that there's no separation between our work and our worship. They flow in to each other, our work flowing into our worship and our worship into our work. Um, there, well, before, before I give us the, the ways that we can be engaged in community, I did want to let y'all know that I am going to be on study leave for this coming week. So um, I'm going to take a breath, think about the sermons for the rest of the summer, and then rejoin you um, next week. But while I am um, on study leave, which, you know, these days is actually a study stay, um, there are lots of ways that you can be in community together this week. We have several opportunities to gather together for prayer. Uh, there is a Bible study that Mary Catherine leads on Monday. On Wednesday morning, we have our transition support group. Uh, Thursdays, there is a prayer and connection group that I usually lead, but Mary Catherine and the group are going to, to self-lead that. And then remember, this coming Saturday, there is the women's gathering on Zoom that Maureen Kalbus and so many other folks have been uh, busy putting together, and it is exciting. Um, Maureen has uh, structured this, the team, so that it will be a women's gathering like our worship that is global. Um, there will be folks from across the country and from around the world for this time. If you, if you still want to sign up for that, you can contact uh, Maureen, and I'll ask um, if, if Vivian or Patrick could put Maureen's um, email address in the, um, in the chat. That would be a, a big help. Thank you. Um, also, hey, look at this. Do you remember the hands that we drew last week? The hands of, of blessing that we did for the installation of officers. There is some of your amazing artwork. Thank you to everybody who sent those in. Those are um, one of the ways that we serve together, blessing each other in our work. There are lots of opportunities for that. You can join the anti-racism team. They'll be having a meeting on Wednesday at four o'clock and you can um, talk to either Raquel Nelson or Royce Truex and they will get you hooked up with that opportunity. You can join in the phone banking and the postcard writing for to support voting rights that Lisa Della Valle is coordinating. Um, Barbara Rothkrug is uh, leading our efforts with the Marin Organizing Committee with all the efforts to support undocumented neighbors. And uh, Nick Morris is still collecting masks for the Marin Street Chaplaincy. These are just some of the ways that you can be connected in doing the work um, that is ours to do in the world. Uh, as we gather together um, in, in worship, this is also a time where we engage in the spiritual practice of sharing our resources. Um, everything we have comes from God and God entrusts it to our care. And in response with gratitude, we, we give some of that back to do good in the world. There are several ways that you can do the offering. We don't have an offering plate that we can pass, but you can go online to our um, Give Online on the website and, and do that through the website. I understand more and more folks are doing that. Uh, or you can uh, mail, mail your offering and your pledge in. Remember both our sensibility and our deacons offerings. Those are offerings that we take up uh, to, to help folks in, in our community and for folks who come, come to us for help. Uh, so if, you, if you're able to give to that fund, I invite you to do that. And in these tough times, if you are struggling and need some help, we also invite you to let us know so that that fund, we can, we can help you out with that. You can let me or um, the deacon moderators, uh, Mary Waitchen and um, Lisa Della Valle know about that. And we have an a opportunity here about a special opportunity uh, to give and support um, the mission work of Juliet Razafier 
Raza Fiera Sua. Um, Juliet has been a part of this congregation. She's been an affiliate member um, for a year and a half, two years now. Uh, Juliet is from Madagascar. She has been studying at the seminary in the Doctor of Ministry program. Uh, I hope you've gotten to meet her. I knew her in my work there and now in my service here, and, and she's just amazing. Um, she's returning to Madagascar to do the dissertation part of her project, which is a project that will enable, um, is, is going to equip and enable ministers, clergy in Madagascar to do prophetic justice work in an environment uh, where there is real fear of government persecution. So she's going in to do that brave and uh, uh, courageous work. And we have the opportunity to, um, the session is authorized, um, an opportunity to give money to support Juliet's work. And so Juliet, I'm gonna invite you to come and tell us a little bit about your, your project and the work that you do in, in Madagascar. Thank you so much, Scott for giving me this uh, opportunity to share. I'm really grateful and I'm blessed to meet you everywhere I go. <laughs> so I'm really blessed. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Scott said, uh, some may know, some might know, I'm Juliette Razafer Su, an ordained pastor of the uh, Church of Jesus Christ in Madagascar, but it called FJKM. I'm working in Antananarivo, the capital of Madagascar, as the director of Ivatu Seminary to train pastors. Uh, in January 2019, I arrived at SFTS to pursue a doctor of ministry studies in order for the school of my denomination to attain its credential. Now, um, I am in the process of completing my dissertation project, which is a training manual for Christian religious leaders. It is based on proclaiming Jesus' message of uh, social justice and human dignity with the uh, intent of equipping pastors to stand as uh, prophetic witnesses because uh, the church in Madagascar needs to address injustice, corruption, and power abuse that deepen the poverty Madagascar is among the poorest country in the world. People are struggling, no food, um, no electricity, no drinking water. You see, look at these people. They are collecting water, this one, but this right side, this is in town in the capital of Madagascar. The water cut off and people need to line up to, to collect water. So not only that, but there is no adequate health system or so healthcare system. And currently insecurity and fear prevail, but the church keep quiet. The church are silent because they are afraid of the government. If uh, people dare to speak, they will be put in jail. So my dissertation is about to equip people to stand. I will return home by October in Paris flight to implement my project at the Vatu Seminary for the uh, evaluation and assessment. And I will offer training also to working pastor Ben, I will submit my dissertation. Um, I invite you to read the summary of my project in the Friday email. If you go down, go down, you will see it. Um, but as a church family, I ask for prayers 
and financial support from you to implement this project because this need money, even $100 or $50 or $20, that will be a big amount in my currency. Uh, you see, if uh, 50 people will give $20 each, that will be a significant amount. 80% of the people in Madagascar live under $2 per day. Could you imagine that? But if you give $2, that will be a very meaningful. The need is huge. I cannot do it alone. So I ask for help. I ask for help. Together we serve. We can serve together in Madagascar. Please join me. I will go ahead. Let us do mission in Madagascar. You can donate for a check to the church and the pastor will do what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what you, what you will give up, but all donation will go to church and the church will be in contact with you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for receiving me. God bless you. Oh, Julia, thank you so much. And I, I hope that you all have had the chance to, to meet and spend time with Juliet. Um, if you are in uh, Juliet's presence, you know that she has a spirit-filled ministry of encouragement. And part of the word of encouragement has courage in it. And as I've talked to her about this, this particular ministry, going back into such a politically repressive environment, um, to equip people to stand up is, is truly courageous. And so um, we invite you to, to support her um, however you can. We do ask that, that you do it by check. There's not an online way. Um, we don't have an online way to do this. So if you want to support Juliet's ministry, you can just send a check to the church. Lori has it all figured out how we will, you know, we will get those funds to her. And in the memo line, just write, support Juliet's ministry or Madagascar ministry or something like that. So we'll know what to do with it. But Juliet, uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be a part of this important ministry and for inviting us into the, this powerful experience. Um, we know that you're going away, but one of the wonderful things about being on Zoom is that maybe we can still be in worship together um, so that we can keep track of, of the important things that you're doing. Friends, as we uh, think about God's presence with us all the time, as we think about God's presence here with us right now, um, wherever you are, God's presence with the people of Madagascar right now, that God's presence beside every person in the whole wide world, um, our response is gratitude, uh, gratitude for love that big. And so I invite you during this time of prayer uh, to offer prayers of gratitude in the chat and Robin is gonna come and uh, offer the offertory. Robin. Hey, pass along shadow. I know that I lie in it and let it through my mind from time to time. Escape an old battle clings on like a vine to me, whispers crooked lies in my ear. And we didn't start this fight But I won't let it rule my heart tonight I can change, I can change I can still change, I can still change
Tracing an old pattern Drawing the lines from where I am And to where I want to be Forget that old adage History continues to Keep us from the world we want to see I am scared that I won't get it right But fear won't rule my heart tonight I can change, I can change I can still change, I can still change I can change I can change, I can still change, I can change. And as we continue in worship, let us continue in song as Danielle comes to lead us in uh, the first verse of Christ to be beside me. Christ be beside me, Christ be before me, Christ be behind me, King of my heart. Christ be within me, Christ be below me, Christ be above me, never to Amen. So friends, I will look forward to being um, back next week and back in worship two weeks from now. Next week, you have a, ge a guest minister, a guest um, preacher, Reverend Marissa Daney. Uh, she is a good friend of mine. She is a hospital chaplain and hospital educator at UCSF Medical Center. She's also a spiritual director, graduate of the DASD program at SFTS, and I know that she will... Um, bring a blessing, a word that will bless this, this community. And uh, Patrick O'Connor and Martha Spears are going to be leading worship. And I'm also aware that we just sang the blessing that I usually do. So I'm going to give you another blessing, friends, from the words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. Um, Paul wrote these words as he was sitting in prison in Rome, uh, experiencing the presence of God envisioning a world as it can be, and experiencing hope. And so he said this, rejoice in God. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to everyone. God is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Go in peace. Amen.